Butterflies and moths are in the Lepidoptera. So Lepidoptera have complete metamorphosis. This is your classic metamorphosis, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. Two pairs of membranous wings. They have overlapping scales. The larvae have chewing mouth parts. The adults have siphoning mouth parts. They're the ones who do the pollinating. So a caterpillar obviously is an insect, so it's going to have your main parts. You've got your head, thorax, abdomen, and six legs. The true legs are six. But a caterpillar has these pro legs that you're going to see here. And so when you're looking out there, they look quite a bit different. The true legs will be close to the head um, and are almost sharp in texture. They can be brightly colored, patterned, hairy, large or small, and they're divided into butterflies and moths. This particular caterpillar is a black swallowtail butterfly. So they're terrestrial, sometimes aquatic. They can be leaf miners, wood borers, fruit borers, which you can see here, this is a coddling moth larva, caused this damage. And there's actually frass in there. That's one sign of caterpillars. Um, leaf chewers, root feeders, close feeders, sometimes they're predators, sometimes they're scavengers. So butterflies have antennae that are slender and knobbed. You can see that in this picture. They're day flyers. The wings are held vertically at rest and then generally speaking they're larger and more brightly co colored than moths and they have slender bodies. So with moths, their antennae are variable. They're thin or feathery. They never have knobs on them. They're usually nocturnal. Their wings are held horizontally over their body at rest. And they're generally small and drab, although there's some pretty interesting giant moths out there that you might come across in warmer regions. They also have stout bodies. So armyworms and cutworms, uh, well, they're a large group. They're pretty closely related to each other. And uh, they feed on native weeds, vegetables, fruits, and ornamentals. There's hundreds of species of these caterpillars. So the generic damage you might see would resemble that of sawfly, earwig, and other chewing pests. The cutworms are largely nocturnal, so you'd have to find them at night. And that's what we have here. We've got a black cutworm here, and it literally has cut this corn plant to the ground. And then army worms are largely diurnal. So there's special, several species of these guys. Uh, Bertha army worm, variegated cutworm, spotted cutworm, army cutworm, zebra caterpillar, black cutworm, etc. This is a variegated cutworm. And if you're ever looking for pest pictures, you can go to IPM Images. I believe I shared that with you as one of our resources, but you'd be amazed at how many pictures are available through uh, RJ Reynolds Tobacco Company. They do quite a bit of uh, photography for their pests that they deal with. And you can see on this picture, you look towards the front of this caterpillar, it's got the true legs, and then you can see the pro legs in the back. They look quite a bit different. Here's the variegated cutworm moth. Okay, here's the life cycle. Larva, pupa, early in the winter. Um, adults, February to March, then the eggs, and then April to May into June, you're going to have the larva that's going to be feeding, and actually into July. This is the time that you want to treat if you're going to treat these guys. So we saw that corn earlier, that was black cutworm that had cut it. It was most likely a fourth instar. They can cut corn pretty easily, but they're pretty big. A sixteenth of an inch is their head capsule. Here's our black cutworm adult. Here's some zebra caterpillars. 
So armyworm caterpillars can skeletonize leaves. Cutworms feed mostly the soil line. They can cut seedling plants off at the ground level, as we've seen. <clears throat> this is the fall armyworm damage on corn. So you manage by controlling weeds, grasses, and debris in the garden that may provide cover for these guys. You can hand pick cutworm larvae when you're out there at night with a flashlight if that's practical. You can scratch the soil at the base of the plants in the daytime to find them. They're, they're in the soil, very close to the surface. The other thing you can try is uh, using a toilet paper roll and burying it halfway when you plant your seedlings so you can make sure that they can't get to the plants. Tillage can help with cutworm. Flood irrigation can also help with cutworm larvae. You want to encourage natural enemies of cutworms, things like, things like birds and spiders. Nematodes can be used, but the soil needs to be warmer than 53 degrees. It is kind of a slow process. Uh, BTK, or Bacillus thuringiensis crustaki, is another way that you can deal with it. This is a naturally occurring soil bacteria, and there are about three different types that are used in horticulture. The BTK are going to be for Lepidoptera. The BTI are going to be for the Diptera, and BT San Jose will be for Coleoptera. Anyway, they need to ingest it to be able to um, be killed by it, so you have to spray the foliage. So what they do is they eat the spore and the toxin. Within minutes, it dies. It binds to the receptors in the gut. Caterpillar stops feeding and then the gut wall breaks down and allows the spores and normal back, gut bacteria to enter the body cavity. And within two, one to two days, the caterpillar actually dies. Okay, another pest in our area is uh, cherry bark tortrix. It attacks sweet cherries, ornamental cherries, and other members of the rosaceae. So cherry bark tortrix are bark borers. They feed under the bark and make irregular tunnels. They cause cracks on the bark and they can cause girdling and possibly the death to the tree. So these are the tunnels. This is frass coming out. These are frass tubes. So that's frass coming out of the bark from where the uh, CBT has bored into the tree. Here's the adult. It prefers prunus, but it will move on to Malus, Crataegus, Pyrus, Pyracantha, Cydonia, Sorbus, and Photinia. So adult activity occurs at dawn and dusk. Peak activity occurs around dawn. Eggs are laid in tree scars and tree crotches. And those of you that have been to the quad at UW where they've got the Yoshino cherries, they have had issues with cherry bark tortrix for a number of years. So larvae em emerge in 14 to 24 days. The first instars feed on the outer sapwood. The second and fifth instars feed between the bark and the cambium layer. And they overwinter as a mixture of second to fifth instar larvae. So you want to avoid mechanical injuries or large pruning cuts because they do like to get into the cracks of trees. Try to conserve parasitic wasps and other predators. Mount Fuji and weeping flowering cherries are very susceptible to attack as, as I said, the Yoshino cherries are. If you're going to use chemical control, and we're talking something beyond BT here, and it really depends on your trees. Are they that valuable to you? I know at the quad they have to do this. You apply in mid-September to early October. The temperatures are usually warm and the conditions are usually dry. You treat the trunk or the graft union and you drench the frass tubes with a low pressure spray until runoff. <laughs>